Hey everyone, welcome back. In this video, we're gonna talk about the Sony A9 and particularly putting it through its paces, trying to break the capabilities of this camera. Recently, I went to Florida on a trip. I do an annual trip to Florida. I love going to Florida for bird photography. And in this trip, um, I had to cancel my original plans, which were which was to go to the Space Coast and photograph at Merritt Island, which I typically do, all the way down to Melbourne and in Vieira wetlands and so forth. And here's the thing, because of the hurricanes, um, I had to change my plans and I decided to move inland to a one hour radius around Orlando. And what I found out was I went to a place called Lake Apopka, which I had never been to before, and a great place to photograph. I've got tons of photography, a little sampling of it here and but what i really wanted to do was i wanted to put this baby to the test as you know i have been talking up the sony a9 as being a great used option on the market right now going for less than three thousand dollars it's probably one of the best values out there now what i did here with this of course i've got my 200 to 600 6.3 lens right here, Sony FE. I've got the FE 1.4X teleconverter and then connected to my A9. Now, this combination, although very interesting and although very powerful, effectively making this rig an 840 millimeter combination, there are some inherent drawbacks and we're gonna talk about those. Going to this area, just after a hurricane, we had a lot of strange weather, um, a lot of very intermittent uh, clouds and rain. And Well, we didn't have a lot of rain, but we had a lot of clouds. Going from that light, cloudy, uh, beautiful overcast condition to the deep overcast, you know, will this A9 hold up under those conditions? And the truth of the matter is yes and no. And we're gonna see that. Let's take a look at the photographs. The first photograph here was taken on day five with my Sony A9, of course, the 200 to 600, 1.4X teleconverter. Every one of them here will have that combination. Not going to repeat it. One two thousandths of a second at F9, ISO 1250. So, you're saying to yourself, well, this doesn't look very challenging, Matt. No, essentially this is an ideal scenario. This is, um, uh, this was late in the morning, um, probably around 10 o'clock. And here we have strong lighting. How did the camera do? How did it perform with the teleconverter with the higher ISO of 1250, which isn't too bad for this camera. Truth be told, this is a fast bird. Okay. The, the, the Harrier is a fast bird. And I would say I lost about 30%. Not horrible losses though. One thing I noticed, and I wasn't quite sure why this was happening, was it was getting close to being in focus, but not completely in focus. And I'm, I'm thinking the reason for that, it has nothing to do with the autofocus system. If you'll look, I'm only at one two thousandths of a second. Really to photograph this species, I really want to be around that 132, 13,000 or higher, basically. And so I've put myself in kind of an awkward situation here. The reality is it probably hit about 80 to 90%, which is to me is awesome. You'll hear people talk about the Sony shooting amazingly and shooting all, everyone in the sequence sharp. But when I'm looking at sharpness, I am looking at critical sharpness. All of these images were sharp, quote, sharp. I want critical sharpness. And so this is one that fell into that category. The next image. So what about portraiture? Portraiture on the same day, 1 2 50th of a second at ISO 2500. Again, F9. Here we have a portrait of this red-shouldered hawk. No problems at all. The camera handled it perfectly, as I would expect a stationary bird. But... The sharpness was there, guys, with the Sony 1.4X teleconverter. Everything was there. Again, I'm punishing this camera. This was in, in a shady spot, open shade. So we're not getting 
a huge amount of direct sunlight. There is some hitting here. You can see it's kind of being broken up by that foliage, right? So we are getting some of that, but the, the key takeaway here, in my opinion, is it did well, okay? No problems whatsoever, as I would expect. The next image, another portrait. Um, here we have a one two thousandths of a second F9 on this Anhinga ISO 800. This was probably my favorite portrait of, of the day. I forget which day I shot this on. I think it was like day three. Um, as you can see, it's very sharp. It's very, um, the background's nice, you know, it did what it was supposed to do again with this, no problems whatsoever. And again, having that 840 millimeters of effective focal length is hard to beat guys. And with the Sony A9, you have such a great noise, uh, the noise is so well controlled that I really think it's a winning combination. Next image. Okay, so we're getting into some, some you know, there's some sunlight out here, but honestly, it's a very cloudy day. And you can see here, I'm at ISO 3200. It's one four thousandths of a second, um, but still pretty light out. And uh, what I really liked about this shot was it was a heavily cropped shot. And I still think that the details are there. I still think this is a, a winning shot. Uh, the white ibis is an amazing bird that can fly very fast. And we have frozen it perfectly here. By the way, just about every single one of these in the sequence were in focus. It did an amazing job here, even with that 1.4X teleconverter. Imagine if he would have been close enough to me to not use the 1.4X. Just think about even more quality you would pick up even faster autofocus systems. Now, let's talk about autofocus for a second. One of the things that I noticed with the 1.4X teleconverter, I don't know if it's because of the 1.4X teleconverter or not. Now, I've heard other photographers talk about this and I was skeptical until I just saw it myself. What I noticed was that with the, um, with the, the 1.4X teleconverter, this combination, Believe it or not, using the autofocus setting with no lock on worked the best for me. So in other words, I used wide in this shot, I used wide and that's it. I, in other words, you just get the little dancing green lights. You don't get the lock on symbol that you're locked. I used that lock on for the entire day one and day two. And so many times I was disappointed in the results and I could not figure out why I switched to this mode and it, it fixed everything immediately. I have no idea why I don't, I don't know if it had to do with a 1.4 X teleconverter. I don't know. I really don't know, but I'll just tell you right now, I had much better results. And from day, you know, the end of day three on, I shot in, uh, entirely with just the standard wide and zone, etc. I did not use lock on. Uh, at all. And that is not supposed to be true. You're supposed to be able to use lock on very effectively. So could have been my fault. I'm just throwing it out there. This is just my experiences. You can take them or leave it. And uh, hopefully that will help you in some way. The next image. Uh, here we have a dark, dark image. This was a dark day. Here we have a, a marsh rabbit. We have them here, I believe, but we do not see them very often. This is more of a coastal thing from North Carolina. Down in Florida, they're more commonplace. And the difference with this species, not to get too far off track, but if you look at them, they're a little smaller bodied, but they have a funny shaped head compared to the Eastern cottontail. They have more of a, I don't know if I'd call it blocky. I don't know what I would call it, but it's different, very different and obvious. When you see one, that's the first thing you'll notice is, you know, if I were to block his head out here, um, it would look like an Eastern cottontail pretty much, but you put his, put that head in there and that's odd. Anyway, <coughs> excuse me. This is ISO 4000. It's dark. It's one five hundredth of a second at F9. The, uh, the, the, this, this combination locked on fine, photographed it fine. This was using a lock on, this was day one. This was uh, 
this was a this was shot with expand flexible spot with lock on um did a fine job i can't i can't see anything wrong with it the focus was great everything was sharp uh, exactly what i would expect from this combination the next one now we're still in some pretty dark conditions here you can tell it's overcast for this tri-colored heron at iso 6400 one two thousandths of a second and what he is doing here is he's doing what i call the dance so he's literally flipping up in the air and trying to scare and he'll raise his wings up like this and he'll try to scare away not scare away but scare the minnows and things toward him and he will actually hunt that way he's actually hunting and this is a great time to get photographs of these guys but how did the autofocus system do fabulous this was with lock on okay i wasn't having problems with these shots with lock on i wasn't having problems with the ones that were kind of on the ground or or it was weird it was like only when they were against a sky was i having problems with lock on i i, I have no idea why but that's the bottom line it did a fabulous job here it had a lot of these in focus considering how erratic he was i was very impressed this i've gotten shots similar to this before uh even back with my 7d 7d mark ii from canon and i can tell you it didn't do anywhere near as good a job of tracking this bird and especially in these dark conditions that we have here totally amazed man it, is it perfect absolutely not is this combination perfect no no, it's absolutely not perfect. It misses, but I am getting a far higher keeper rate. I probably, you know, from that trip to Florida, just to give you an idea, I had 60 images that are sellable images. I mean, they're good enough to sell, and I've already put them into the rotation to be sold. So understand that when I used to go out before, like many, many years ago, when I would go out, I would be lucky to get 10, 12 images that I could sell, you know, because, and I'm picky. Okay, I am. I'm very picky about my shots. But just to show you how much of an increase that is, it's like three times as many. No, it's more than that. Uh, what did I say? Ten, six, six. I mean, it's three times. No, it's six times, right? Roughly, almost six times. Wow. I mean, I, I wasn't even ready for that math, but yeah, that's six times. So I am very happy. I am a happy camper right now. It, if you've listened to my podcast over the years, you'll, you'll realize that one of my things is that in, a, in, in, for part-time pros like me, okay, it's important to find a, a camera system that's somewhat inexpensive. Obviously this is not ridiculously inexpensive but somewhat inexpensive that can do what it needs to do quickly and accurately because i can't get out very often i can't get to florida very often i can't get to alaska i can't get to these great national parks out west like yellowstone and so uh, these cameras help make up for that these modern cameras just do amazing amazing things okay anyway next image all right now we're in the flight again uh again a dark day iso 5000 125 of a second would have been better here at 13500 or higher this is a duck this happens to be a blue wing teal and the blue wing teal is a fast duck but it's a duck that you can get glass on it's a duck that um behavioral wise they they basically move their head like this back and forth across the water. And what that does is they're scooping up seeds and little things on the surface of the water. And if you look at this image closely right here, you will see that he has like, you know, some, some greenery on his face from doing just that kind of plowing through the water. They're not really, I guess you, I guess you could classify them as a dipping duck. I don't know. Uh, they're definitely not divers. They just scoop along the water. So um, probably a good, a good hunt duck to hunt because they they don't eat nasty stuff so anyway this is a teal again you know 
how did it do with the sequence? Okay, the sequence was very similar to every other sequence. I did have about you know 20% to 25%, somewhere in there, maybe up to 30 of out of focus images, but they were only just slightly out of focus. And many times it was camera blur because I really needed to be at 13500 right here. Uh, anybody that's photographed ducks, they know what I'm talking about. These little buggers are bullets. They come out of there and it's like, boom. I mean, they're just bullets. So, by the way, this is a first for me. This is the first I've actually got an in-focus shot of a blue wing teal, and I was happy to do that. I'm, I'm not, I love waterfowl, but I'm not the kind of guy that's going to go out there, you know, get in the inner tube, build a little... Uh, hide over my head and go out there along the surface of the water. Just not my cup of tea. One, I don't like gators. Two, I don't like snakes. So that's not cool for me, right? Anyway, you can see the job that it's doing. The next image, we're talking about a American alligator. Now the American alligator is so prevalent here at Lake Apopka that if you love gators, you need to go to Lake Apopka. You need to go there. The other place you need to go is the Circle, I think it's a Circle Bar B. Circle B Bar, or something like that. Um, ranch Preserve south of Orlando, down toward Lakeland. And uh, lots of gators there. I, I, I'm okay with gators. I mean, they don't really do anything. So I don't photograph them heavily, but I do photograph them. So here, why am I a 32 hundredth of a second ISO 6400? <clears throat> uh, because I was doing flight shots and I was just transitioning back and forth. There were, it was, I mean, it was hot and heavy photography on day five. This was a day, I take that back. This was a day four image, um, but it was good on day four as well. Just not quite as good as day five. But you can see the overcast conditions here. And again, you can see uh, this, this guy was actually moving toward me and he was stopping right about here because he's getting close to his vegetation. And it did fine, tracked his eye fine. I put it right on his eye, no problem whatsoever. Next image, another uh, stationary image, one two thousandths of a second at ISO 6400. Again, in overcast conditions with this double crested cormorant here. Love that bird, another favorite bird of mine. Um, love the teal eye that the, uh, that the species has just a beautiful bird did perfectly one, two thousandths of a second. The next image, a creeping, a green heron creeping along. Okay. Now we've got some movement here. This is not a bird in flight, but we've got him moving, um, on this particular image. I believe I used, I can't remember to be honest with you, but it was not an automate, it was not an automatic, um, it wasn't like wide focus area or center or anything like that. It was probably expand flexible spot or something along those lines. So um, it did fine tracking him, absolutely fine. ISO 3200, 125 hundredth of a second. Next image. Into the Osprey in flight on a good day. Probably 90% of these Osprey images in the sequence were in focus. Um, it did a fine job tracking him. I was in wide here and it just locked right in and fired. And when I say it locked in, I mean, I didn't have to sit there and just keep hitting that autofocus, by the way. I mean, I would lock in one time on that sucker and it would just hold right on to him. So this whole concept of, you know, having to bump, like we used, with Canon, we used to have to bump our autofocus constantly. That really, it, it, it can happen with a Sony, and I, ha I did have a couple situations, but not my experience at all. Um, it, it just stayed locked on and did a tremendous job. Again, guys, F9. We're talking about F9 here. With a teleconverter in between the lenses, slowing it down, possibly, right? And it just still nailed the shots. And the Osprey's a fast bird. 
Okay, next image. One, one thousandth of a second. I did, I slowed everything down here and did a, at ISO 3200, I did a nice cormorant silhouette here. I'm a sucker for silhouettes, you guys know that. Um, I think it turned out great, it's sharp. Camera did what it was supposed to do. Next image. We have a, and guys, I'm, hey, if you need to go, go ahead. But I, you know, I'm just going to keep going through these images because I want you to see what I was able to do. Um, here we have a great blue heron spearing a nasty fish. This is an armored catfish. It is a species that should not be in Florida. And every time one of these guys can kill one and eat it, we are much better off. Um, they are an invasive species. So here he's got him speared and he's ready to eat it. Again, an action shot, one four thousandths of a second. Again, because I'm ready for that, you know, ISO 800. I am ready at a moment's notice for that hawk flying by, for that peregrine falcon flying by. I don't want to be in a situation where just for the sake of shooting lower ISO, I'm down below you know, 130 200th of a second. I want to nail this shot. And by the way, this is, you know, it's 840 millimeters. So you got to think that affects your shutter speed. So you got to keep those shutter speeds high, higher with the 1.4 X teleconverter. Something to remember. All right. I put this next image in here because I thought it was freaking cool. Not because it's anything amazing or tough for the A9 to do. But because this is the first time I've photographed a whistling duck, a falvus whistling, whistling duck in the wild down here in Florida. Very happy to see that. Uh, one one thousandth of a second, ISO 1000. By the way, that's the seven. The, okay, let's stop for a second and talk about this. This is actually the A7R Mark III, okay, with the 1.4X teleconverter. So I'm either manually focusing here or I'm pressing my luck by trying to actually use the autofocus system, which I think I was doing the latter. It will work, but not very well. And so here you're seeing that, but I wasn't able to get much, much closer. That's a 1200 millimeter shot because I've got APS-C mode engaged. Now we're on to Polk County. I'm out of Apopka now. We're down uh, in Polk County for an Osprey with a fish. No big action going on here, but again, just showing the diverse shots that are possible with this combination. We are at ISO 3200 at 1 3200th of a second. The next image. Okay. ISO 8000, guys. Darkness has fallen pretty much. 1 1250th of a second, F9. And here we have an Anhinga that has speared another nasty fish that shouldn't be in Florida. This is the um, sucker mouthed catfish. And it is also an invasive species. So thank you, Anhinga, for killing yet another one and feeding you. Um, but it's an action shot. He is banging that thing and trying to get it into his mouth. I don't know if you've ever seen Anhingas do this, but they will actually, uh, <clears throat> he's up on a log and he's smacking. He's smacking that sucker down on that log and trying to maneuver it so he can get it into his, into his mouth and down his throat. So that's what you're seeing there. Uh, it's hard to see without video on that one. And that's really all I had. I hope that you kind of saw the, the wide range of possibilities with this camera. I truly did put it through its paces. I have more flate shots I could have put in here. There, there was multiple shots of the, uh, and if you, know, you want to see them, you can go out and check them out on my website or, or check them out um, on Facebook. I'll be putting them all out there. Um, there was a number of hawk shots. There was a number of um, wading birds flying and hinga. Um, it did a, a, a tremendous job. I cannot be happier. Would it have done better with an F4 lens? That's a big question I have. You know, and that's a question I hope to answer. I'm going to get one in here 
if I if if it's the last thing I do, I'm gonna get an f4 lens in the next time I go to do one of these because I want to see exactly the differences. I know what the differences were with Canon because I tested those back when I was a Canon guy, but Sony, I don't know. Is it better? Is it worse? I will have to determine that for myself. I don't listen to other people so much. Um, I, I kind of do. I listen to them and then I say, okay, well, they're saying it's going to do X and then I go out and test it also. And everyone should do that. You shouldn't just listen to anybody on the you know, on YouTube, but I mean, do understand some of us do have a lot of experience, so we can't help you. But anyway, that's all I had for this video. Thanks for watching. As always, make it a great day and get out there and enjoy nature. Bye-bye.